Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Yelena and I'm currently doing my bachelor's degree in chemistry and today I will be talking about artificial intelligence in medical diagnosis and try to answer the question if AI will replace doctors in the future. So I came across this um, topic when I read an article in The Guardian in the beginning of this year with the title AI system outperforms experts in spotting breast cancer. It's a program developed by Google Health, in particular by Google DeepMind. Google DeepMind is a company that was funded, uh, founded in 2010, but then bought by Google in 2014. And what they did, they tested mammograms on doctors and on AI systems, and the AI system made a uh, less error than the doctors did. So this sounds really incredible because breast cancer is a big issue among women. About one in every eight women get diagnosed with breast cancer at one point in their lives. Early treatment is also crucial because the survival rate is about 80% for stage one breast cancer, but about 30, it drops to about 30% for stage four breast cancer. So it is a big issue and an AI system could help that a lot, especially for early diagnosis. So this sounds incredible, but is it too good to be true? And upon doing more research, I actually found out that it is too good to be true. In November 2019, the Wall Street Journal was one of the first ones to expose Google on their so-called Project Nightingale and many other newspapers such as the Süddeutsche Zeitung and The Guardian followed that example. The title of the Wall Street Journal was Google's Project Nightingale gathers personal health data on millions of Americans. So what exactly is that Project Nightingale? Project Nightingale is a cooperation between Google DeepMind and Ascension. Ascension is a healthcare company based in the US and they own a lot of healthcare facilities, including over 150 hospitals. And what they did is they um, gave a data from over 50 million Americans, their health data, to DeepMind in order for them being able to develop AI systems to discover different illnesses such as um, breast cancer. This data was, of course, non-anonymous, and it contained information like their addresses, their names, their age, their gender, and all their medical information, without, of course, of course, the patients knowing. So how is that even legally possible? The issue is the US law, a loophole in the US law, which states that medical data can be used non-anonymously if it is used to improve patient care. And this is exactly what Google DeepMind is doing in this case, at least they say they're doing that. And there's even a whole section on their page called safety and ethics with the quote, we want AI to benefit the world, so we must be thoughtful about how it's used, how it's built and used. So Google DeepMind is really making sure that we all believe that they are using this data for only to improve patients' care. But of course, Google DeepMind are not the only ones using this data and are not the only ones interested in our medical data. So who wants our medical data? If we go to a doctor and we give our medical information, then what the hospitals where a doctor, doctors work they can then sell this data to different companies, just like Ascension did. This is possible in the US, but not in the EU. So what they do, so a company like Zelf, um, what they do is they work directly with doctors. And that works like that. Let's say a pregnant woman comes to a doctor and wants to have things to improve her pregnancy. The doctor can go on Zelf and look up the word pregnancy. Xelf provides a list with things that could improve a woman's pregnancy, their well being in the pregnancy. So then the doctor can choose the things that are actually useful in this case for this woman. The woman then goes home, 
the woman goes home, goes on that list and can buy these things directly off of Amazon. So Zalf works are like directly with Amazon. And Amazon is actually starting to work on their own things like that, but this is very early stages and not out in the open yet. Another company that is also collecting our medical data is Apple. Whenever we measure our heart rates or we tell them how many steps we took that day, Apple collects this data. Two other big branches that are using the data are the pharma industry, and they are using it to um, improve drug development, but they're also using it to, for direct advertisement or can use it for direct advertisement in the future. And on the other hand, we have the health insurances. They can use this information to detect fraud, but they can also use it to um, they can also use it to um, they can choose who they want to insure or not. If they realize a patient has very expensive treatment, they can then say, okay, we don't want to insure you. Another big problem next to bias, uh, next to privacy, is bias. We talked about that two weeks ago, but it is such a crucial topic here. I really want to mention it. There are three three types how bias can enter an AI system in medicine. One of them is missing data. So let's say someone for any reason has, gets healthcare in multiple countries, let's say an immigrant or a refugee. So what happens is if an AI system only takes data from a certain country or maybe with a certain language, a lot of the treatment data is missing. So from a certain patient, maybe the illness is, they know the illness, they know the person, but they don't know how this illness was treated. And what happens is that sometimes the outcome cannot be assigned to the individual or the treatment cannot be assigned to the illness or disease. Another big problem how bias enters the system is sample size or sample type. This happens if the sample size is too small and or not diverse enough, or if um, it's, it's, it's too small, or if it's not diverse enough. Um, and for that, I have an example, which is skin cancer. Now, AI is also being used in the detection of skin cancer. And in 2017, a group of researchers found a way to detect different skin cancer types with images. And what they did is they used over 100,000 images of different types of skin cancer. 60,000 of these images were from Google images, but only 5% were from people with darker complexion. This is a huge, huge problem because, because, um, because people with darker complexions are, actually have a higher mortality rate for skin cancer. This is due to the reason that a lot of people with darker complexion think because of their darker complexion, they are not, they cannot get breast their skin cancer, which of course is not the case. They do, their skin protects them a bit from UV radiation, but not fully. And therefore, usually the cancer, the cancer, the skin cancer is detected much later on. And the third type of bias is misclassification. So let's say a system, an AI system was trained in Switzerland where the healthcare system is incredibly good and the technology is very advanced. This, what then can happen if this system is used in let's say a third world country, they are not able to find this treatment or cannot get the appropriate analysis like a mammogram, an X-ray to get the appropriate diagnosis. So this often leads to a lot of false results. So after privacy and bias, I now want to talk about transparency. So because this is such a new technology, when computer scientists are looking if the system is working, what they do is they take small random data sets. This of course leads to more bias, bigger errors and over interpretation because a small random data set is not representative for the whole data set. Another issue is the publication of these 
researchers. So because it is, so, it is such a new technology, a lot, a lot of people are working on it and publishing papers about it. And what they do is they publish it on pages like argzip.org that are not really scientifically approved, which then means that these papers have not been corrected properly and no one knows if what they say is actually true or doesn't make sense at all. And the third issue with transparency is a tracing of data. In chemistry, when you find a new molecule, and you find you send synthesis for a certain molecule and you publish a paper about it, you have to write step by step how exactly you synthesized this certain molecule. But this is not possible here because the people cannot publish the data sets that they use due to privacy reasons. And also they usually, or most likely, they don't publish their algorithms. So no one can really follow what exactly has been done in the research. And the fourth big ethical problem is overdiagnosis. And the question if knowing everything is always the best idea. And for that, I wanna give an example, the so-called Angelina Jolie effect. So in 2013, Angelina Jolie got tested for the BRCA um, gene mutation. And she got tested positively for that, which means that she's more prone to getting ovarian and breast cancer. That does not mean that she is going to get it, but she is more prone to get it. And what she did that is that she got a mastectomy and also a breast reconstruction. Because she was so outspoken about this topic, the number of BRCA tests almost doubled. But there was no increase in the number of mastectomies. Nevertheless, a mastectomy is a, is a surgical inter interference, which means that it's very dangerous like any surgical procedure is, and also it is very expensive. And additionally, mastectomy is emotionally very challenging. It can lead to depression due to the lack of sexual identity. And a lot of people cannot afford breast reconstruction like Angelina Jolie could. So this, of course, is a huge problem because these women get these tests and they maybe get a mastectomy and go into financial crisis or get depression, even though they would have never even gotten the cancer uh, in, later on in their lives. So was it really good to know this? So. As usual, we want to ask ourselves, who are the stakeholders in this situation? I think we have four big stakeholders. We have the patients that can profit from a faster diagnosis, an earlier diagnosis, and often a cheaper diagnosis. And then we have the doctors. The doctors that can profit from the AI to um, Maybe if they're unsure with a certain decision, they can ask the AI system and look what the AI system thinks. But what can also happen is bias in the doctor's opinion. If the AI system has a completely different view than the doctor, maybe the doctor's opinion might change even though the opinion was correct in the first place. And then we have the companies such as Xalf, as we talked about, Google DeepMind, Apple, Amazon, and we also have um, we also have companies, the pharmaceutical companies, and the health insurances that can profit, but can also misuse this information. So let's go back to the initial question: If AI will replace doctors? Of course, this is not a yes or no question. On one hand, AI delivers better results in general. Um, it is cheaper because more patients can be diagnosed in a shorter amount of time. There is more data for a single AI system. So even the most experienced doctor cannot have as much information as an AI system can. Therefore, the AI is also faster. 
On the other hand, it is an incredibly new technology. As you saw, a lot of the papers, articles are from 2019 and even 2020. And it's also the question comes up if the, if the AI system is more used in the hospitals, will patients trust this AI system? Because human interaction is so important for a successful diagnosis. Sometimes a mammogram or an x-ray are not enough to make a good and full diagnosis. And, and the emotional state and the, his, the family background, stuff like that, that maybe the AI system doesn't have this information the doctor can have when talking to the patient. And the fourth big problem is bias. Bias due to the lack of transparency, gender, ethnicity, and et cetera, et cetera. So how will AI in medicine look like in the future? I think a big thing is to start AI training early in the education for in medical school. And this is actually already being done at ETH. And in this first semester, they already have courses on AI in medicine and they talk about the ethical issues, but also about the um, profits and the good parts about AI in medicine. An uh, additional thing is that AI can be used as an additional opinion. So let's say you have a serious disease, you go maybe to a second doctor or a third doctor to get additional opinions. This way the AI system could at the same place give you this second opinion. And the third thing for the future of AI in medicine is the data acquisition has to be better. It has to be regulated more by the law and there has to be more diversity in the data that the patient's approval has to be um, has to be made sure of and there has to be more transparency and this is really the government's job they have to make sure that there are laws and rules to make sure that these things um, happen there is more diversity than the patients know where this data is going and that there is more transparency so in general, I think that I can say that doctors should not be replaced, but rather supported by AI in medicine. And with that, I am at the end of my presentation and I'm very welcome to answer your questions.